one of the elements of where they want to take the world is a, a third world war, which they wish to involve um, Europe, uh, the United States, and well, Canada, North America, and um, Russia and China. I was told by insiders in the 1990s uh, about in America that uh, the plan was to, to lead to a conflict involving China. For this reason, in the, in the 1800s, um, letters were written, and uh, particularly one particular letter, between two um, high-level um, players in the secret society network, in which the three world wars were described of where they were going to go. And this letter um, included the detail of countries that would be involved and how it would be started. And it um, described the First World War with the, the Germans um, brought into conflict with um, the rest of Europe and uh, America. It described the Second World War um, in the same terms and said it would lead to a um, Jewish state in Israel. And the Third World War would be triggered out of the Middle East, involving Israel as the trigger, and would um, bring about the final global conflict, uh, which would lead to them being able to offer the solution to stop this ever happening again, which would be a world government and a single world army. And the idea of that is to say, if we have a single world army, and we bring an end to nation, national armies, then we can't ever again have a war. What they won't tell you is those that have manipulated the war will be the same people that offer the solution to the war, which is exactly the structure of control that they want. And I feel very strongly that Georgia, I'm not saying this war is going to happen tomorrow, but Georgia was a move, a move on the chessboard in this direction. And um, I'll tell you a story that happened to me in England which relates to this um, and it seems you know quite a, a minor story until it starts to play out last March March 2008 I was uh, received a letter from uh, a man in England who is a what we call there or called there a traffic warden and his job they walk along the streets in a uniform and they give out tickets to cars for illegal parking or whatever you know not many people like them for that reason, but they just do that job. And this traffic warden, he'd been a traffic warden for nearly 20 years, um, he wrote to me because he, he read my books and he said, look, there's something I don't understand and there's something that's really bewildering me. He said, um, I've been called in to, by my boss and I've, like my colleagues, he said, I've been given three cards, authorization cards. He said, one of the cards is to give me authorization to be a traffic warden. Okay. But the second card was what they call in Britain a pace card, and that carries the words that policemen have to say by law when they're arresting somebody. And the third card was the authorization of this man and his colleagues, traffic wardens, to go into private property without permission. So this man, who's a nice guy, he said to his boss, why do I need the statement you make to arrest people if you're a policeman? And why do I need the authorization to go into private property? And his boss said, look, I'd be told to give them out, take them home, leave them until further notice. A few days later, him and a few other traffic wardens are outside the police station in this county, this town. And a, and a policeman came out that this traffic warden had known a long time, I hadn't seen for a while. And the policeman came over and made the small talk, and then he pulled his friend aside and said, I want to talk to you. And he said to him four or five times in this conversation, you must not breathe a word about this. He said, I've, I've got the job, he said, in this county, and there's someone like me in every other county of the United Kingdom, policeman, whose job it is, is to organize in preparation for a coming war. He said, we're preparing for this war well in advance. And he said, what's expected by the government is that when this war starts, 
there will be massive civil unrest on the streets of Britain and protest. He said, so what's happening is that when, when that war starts and the, um, the protests start, the civil unrest they're expecting, the military, the military and ourselves, police officers, will be focusing on dealing with the civil unrest. And you, traffic wardens, uh, private security guards and companies, um, closed circuit television operators and all these kind of people will be brought forward to do the jobs that policemen currently, police officers currently do while we're dealing with a civil unrest. Well, he sent me the cards and I saw them to confirm that they existed. A few days after he contacted me, the British government announced that they were going to redesignate and rename traffic wardens civil enforcement officers and they were going to give them powers, some of the powers currently uh, uh, that the police have. Ten days ago, all these months later after this happened, ten days ago the government in Britain announced that they were uh, introducing a new designation of um, authority called accredited persons. And these were security guards, private security firms, uh, um, CCTV operators, etc., who were going to be given um, accredited person status and given powers um, that are currently the uh, powers of the police. Now, why I tell this story is that everything that this police officer said was going to happen is happening or has happened. The only thing that remains is the war. And that fits um, with um, all these other different pieces of information that suggests that uh, a major conflict is being orchestrated, which is designed to change the face of society. Because there's nothing that changes society faster than a war. And this has been going on way back. One of the um, uh, examples that I put in my books is this, the First World War in relation to America. Um, in the 1950s there was an investigation by a congressional committee called the, uh, the Reese Committee into what are known in America as tax-exempt foundations. These are um, organizations funded by the Rockefellers and the major elite families who then pass the money out in apparently charitable ways, but it's nothing to do with charity, it's to do, to do with um, uh, funding this agenda while appearing not to be. And one of these organizations that they investigated, um, and there was a guy called Norman Dodds who was the main investigator, was a, an organization which is still going in America called the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. What these investigators found was that this endowment for international peace was manipulating war. And they found minutes of uh, meetings of this organization from the period in the early part of the 20th century in which they were having meetings and discussions and saying, we need to change the face of American society and, and uh, society in general. What's the most effective way of doing that. Well, it's a war. So we need to get America involved in a war. And Woodrow Wilson was the president of America at the time. And it's actually in the minutes of this organization that they sent uh, messages to Woodrow Wilson telling him not only to he must get involved in this war, this war in Europe, but that he must stay in it for as long as it takes for American society to change in a way that's never going to change back again. And if you look at the world after, the, after a war, it's never the same as it was before, especially uh, world wars. And they want this third world war to change the, the, the face of global society to the point where they can introduce this centralized global uh, structure. Um, and. Uh, as they used to say in, 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 in the 1960s with the Vietnam War, what would happen if we had a war and no one turned up? There'd be no war. What these people do is they declare wars and they get the rest of us to fight them. What we've got to do is stop fighting them and stop 
falling for this scam. Because if we do, if we go into this third world war, then, you know, goodbye freedom.